Hello, hello. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's right. Thanks. Well, welcome everyone to the 27th TCG National Conference and welcome to Portland, Oregon. While this is our first all-conference plenary session, we've been very busy over the last few days. Our grantees have been meeting for networking and professional development opportunities since Sunday. And yesterday, we held two pre-conferences with our global theater initiative partners, the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics. We hosted the global pre-conference. It featured powerful conversations embracing theater's function as a space of solidarity, inspired by this sanctuary city of Portland where police departments personally welcome new immigrants to the community. And we were inspired by the art itself with a timely performance of Amarillo by Teatro Linea de Sombra from Mexico City. And by the way, it is a remarkable, moving performance and tickets are still available for a 7.30 p.m. encore performance tomorrow night. So get your tickets. The Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Institute convened at Portland Center Stage at the Armory to continue working for equity on a personal, organizational, and field-wide level. Those conversations continued today during the launch of the At the Inter Intersections arc, which also saw over 100 theater people take Maker Day field trips to roll up their sleeves, engage in maker culture, and also enjoy a late morning beer tasting. <laughs> so if any of your colleagues seem a little more effusive than usual, <laughs> that might be why. Uh, so as often as the case with these things, what we're calling the start of the conference is actually more like the early middle. Uh, so many of the conversations we'll be having over the next three days are picking up where we left off last year in Washington, D.C. That circular sense of progress that we're always somewhere between honoring the past and creating the future is part of what prompted our conference theme of full circle. The conference is also an opportunity to track the progress of our own lives on that circle. If this is your first conference, and I know many of you are experiencing your first conference, ask me about my first conference in 1996 when I heard August Wilson give his seminal remarks, the ground on which I stand. That awestruck early career managing leader is still here inside me. Just as I know those who have left our circle over the past year, and it feels like we've lost a lot this past year, doesn't it? But we know their legacy lives in each of us, so to help me honor those who have left our circle so full of their presence, I'd like to welcome a few friends and colleagues to the stage. We're going to share a few words from some of those we've lost. I'll get us started. Zelda Fitchhandler, once we made the choice to produce our plays not to recoup an investment, but to recoup some corner of the universe for our understanding and enlargement, we entered the same world as the university, the museum, the church, and became like them an instrument of civilization. Jim Houghton. We get to collide. The artists and audience get to breathe the same air. We have such an appetite for it, whether we're colliding with ourselves, in the story we're seeing, or the people we're seeing it with, or the artists we bump into. To me, that's what theater is. Gordon Davidson. I believe it must be the job of theater to take hard looks at life, at issues people don't always want to confront. They will listen to what is said to them from a stage. 
That is the power of theater. I respect it. I am in awe of it. Max Feta. We realized we wanted more than a nine to five existence here in the United States of America. We wanted to create something on our own. Miriam Colon, giving this to the children, helping them discover the richness of their own culture, the richness of what our contribution is to society when we are gone. That's all that stays. Martha Levy. This is the central conviction of the theater, that by listening closely to the lives of others, we will, we will know ourselves more fully and locate ourselves in a more generous world. Sam G. Robertson, Jr. I work with passion. I speak with passion. I create with a passion. Because my breath, I don't take for granted. I know that the next one isn't promised. So every breath I take, I may, might as well use it. These are not the only words they gave us, and these are not the only lives we've lost in the past year. So let's please take a moment of silence to honor together whoever we each need to honor right now. Thank you. Their legacies of courage and creativity live in us. When we feel burnt out and overwhelmed, our memories of them nourish us and keep us moving forward. And knowing how fiercely each of them loved work in a room full of theater people, I know they'd want us to enjoy our time together. So let's do it. Here we are, ready for an intense but joyful and celebratory three days together. We'll exchange knowledge, build relationships, share new models, dine around and dance, and experience the wonderful theater city that Portland is. So to help us do just that, I'd like to welcome our host committee chairs, Cynthia Furman, Chief Operating Officer of Portland Center Stage, and Sarah Horton, Managing Director of Artist Repertory Theater. Everybody. Welcome to Portland. We're so excited you're here. You're beautiful. Um, we just want to talk a little bit about Portland for you a moment and then also talk a little bit about coming together for this conference. Um, Portland is the liberal, quirky, small town, big city that the New York Times is so fond of reporting about. And then the mockumentary Portlandia made famous. Chickens in every backyard. Legal weed, lots of great beer and wine, and when you're hungover, food carts that take care of that for you. <laughs> but we're at the same time a city and a state struggling with a lot of change, and really only beginning to recognize that our long history of determined exclusion has had a lasting presence that still holds us back today. Portlanders love their city, and more and more of us are committed to making it a more equitable place. And we experience every day the deep bravery, the love, the pain and the hope in that work. One of the things that gives us joy is our brilliant and prolific theater community. Did you know that two of the Northwest four Lort theaters are here in Portland, but we are only two of last anybody counted at least 80 theater companies of all sizes, of all missions, but all with a lot of pluck.
the maker ethos that we're celebrating with this conference uh, permeates our theater community with ingenuity, resourcefulness, a collaborative spirit, and one that acknowledges our strength as a community and our openness to tackling the frightening and the unknown. Many of those theaters joined the Portland Host Committee this year, 35 people from 21 different organizations. This group worked together for the past year, accomplishing a very Portland array of chores. Borrowing wrestling mats, <laughs> opening doors to the puppet master of Scapoose, for those of you that went to Michael Curry's studio, recruiting volunteers, raising money, and making sure that the parties at our two theaters, uh, you'll be sampling the best local food and drink that Portland has to offer. And we even made sure that the second largest floral parade in the world will be going by the front door of the hotel on Saturday morning. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, so we want to say thank you today to the members of that amazing host committee that made this happen. Would you all please stand for a second so we can acknowledge you? And there's two people we particularly want to call out tonight. We want to say thank you to Hannah Fenlon and Devin Berkshire of TCG. <laughs> Those two women are unrelentingly positive, committed, energetic, and it is a wonder to behold. We both agree nobody could do this thing better, and we both agree we never want their jobs. Um, also, you may not know that you are truly on the western frontier of TCG conferences. We are now by three-tenths of a longitudinal point, the farthest west the conference has ever traveled. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> Out here in the west, uh, the innovation, self-reliance, and strong sense of place have a long defined our way of life, and these are also the driving characteristics of the notion of full circle, and also to making great beer and wine. So we have two housekeeping notes. As we mentioned, the Rose Festival Grand Floral Parade and the biggest day of the Rose Festival is Saturday. So that parade passes right past in front of the hotel. So if y'all are planning on leaving town Saturday, just give it, it'll be fine, but give yourselves a little extra time. And the other thing is, as Claudia mentioned earlier at one of the sessions, we're gonna have a moment at the party tonight to do a little collective action and take a photo. So if you're coming to the party, hold onto the heart we'll give you at the front door and we'll gather for a photo opportunity uh, at about 8.45. We are happy and so proud to be sharing our home with all of you. Have a wonderful time. My chickens will be at the late night party. Uh, welcome and tear it up in the name of theater, everybody. measure to make sure that we be in the farthest west location that the conference ever has been. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, our hosts here have been so wonderful and um, really making it possible for us to, ho to bring you all here. Um, the, another group has been very instrumental in making this conference possible, and those are our conference funders. Um, it, without them, there is no way we would have been able to accomplish all of this. And I'd like to take the opportunity to just mention each of them out loud. Artslandia Magazine, Broadway Rose Theater Company, Ellen Bai, and you can hold your applause until I get to the end. Uh, Ellen Bai, Charcoal, Charcoal Blue LLP, Walt Disney Imagineering Creative Entertainment, the Ruth Easton Fund, Edgerton Foundation, Fisher Dax Associates, Howard Gilman Foundation, the Kinsman Foundation, the Jackson Foundation, Meyer Memorial Trust, the Miller Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, Patron Technology, Scanduzi Krebs, Tessitura Network, Travel Portland, TRG Arts, and the Weisberg Foundation. Thank you, funders. Uh, I also want to introduce you to the grantees 
who are being featured in our Spotlight On program, could our Spotlight On participants from the Rising Leaders of Color, Fox Fellowship, and Leadership U programs stand or signal as you are able? These are the artists and leaders who are already having a major impact on our field, and you should know them. Speaking of honoring impact, please join me in welcoming Braden Abraham, Artistic Director of Seattle Rep, to present our Theater Practitioner Award. Good evening. Um, I'm Braden Abraham. I'm the artistic director at Seattle Rep. And uh, as a fellow artistic director and a longtime fan of Linda Hartzell, it is an honor to present her with this award. I realized when I was writing up these remarks that I've been watching Linda's work for about 30 years now, since I was about nine or 10, actually. And um, my family didn't attend the theater. I grew up in a sort of Captain Fantastic situation in the North Puget Sound, if any of you have seen that movie. Uh, very rural, a little magical, and somewhat feral. And um, seeing a play for the first time on a school trip was one of my first encounters with the live arts. The play I saw was James and the Giant Peach, which had a familiar sort of acid trip quality to it. <laughs> at the Seattle Children's Theater, in their original little space at the Woodland Park Zoo. So really, Linda is to blame for my path into the theater. Um, for me and so many others, Linda has been a role model as an arts leader and also as a director who blazed her own trail through uh, the Pacific Northwest. She was hired to lead Seattle Children's Theater in 1984. At first, she thought she was the wrong person for the job, having cut her teeth as a director in Seattle's more experimental houses, the empty space and the Pioneer Square Theater. But the persistent and forward-thinking board leadership at the time knew that this up-and-coming theater artist who had just directed the hit premiere of Angry Housewives, a feminist punk rock musical, was exactly the person who should be running the children's theater. <laughs> we all know that theater is an endurance sport. The rewards are great, but it's going to cost you something in return. I'm not sure what it takes to run a theater for 30 plus years, but it must be some combination of what Linda has to offer. Generosity and vision, of course. Guts, the ability to think on her feet and think creatively, a wild, boundless imagination, absolute determination, and of course, a healthy sense of humor. She's reached millions of kids like me, moving SCT from that little space at the zoo to the expansive and beautiful Charlotte Martin Theater she built at Seattle Center. Over the last few decades, Linda has created one of the leading theaters for young people in the country, expanding her work as an artist and offering home to many actors, directors, and notable playwrights. She commissioned over 100 plays for SCT. And I just wanted to leave you with a few words from a couple of those playwrights that she commissioned. Uh, Cheryl West writes, who, uh, Cheryl West, who worked with Linda on several projects. She said, um, two of my favorite directives from Linda were, you gotta get the wiggle room out of that scene, Cheryl. <laughs> and her favorite compliment, it's really moving, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. <laughs> I don't think I'm getting the emphasis right on that, but. <laughs> Linda's devotion to producing and creating work that ignites joy in our children is nothing short of amazing. That's from, that's from Cheryl. And from Stephen Dietz, quote, many artistic directors know what their audience wants. Linda Hartzell was that rare artistic director who knew what her audiences needed. And I say audiences in the plural since Linda had to diligently navigate the complicated double audience of TYA work. The parents who pay for the tickets and the kids who go on the ride. With, with the full knowledge of the magnitude of this comparison, I submit that Linda Hartzell has proven herself to be the Zelda Fitzchandler of American children's theater. 
Her impact is bold, profound, and lasting. There's no doubt in my mind that if Linda had done her work in the Eastern Corridor and not in the evergreen splendor of faraway Seattle, not as far as Portland, but far away, <laughs> her face would be on currency. That's from Stephen Dietz. Please join me in welcoming this year's recipient of the Theater Practitioner Award, Linda Hartzell. Thank you, thank you, my fellow thespians. Thank you. I'm, I can't tell you how touched I am with this award. Um, <clears throat> I would like to thank everyone at TCG: Teresa, Ben Cameron, who was my mentor, the current and past board of trustees, the staff, the membership. Thank you, dear, wonderful Braden, for that incredible introduction. And very quickly, thank you, Karen Sharp, SCT's Managing Director, and Ellen and Nolan on the National Council. She's also an SCT uh, board member, but she was the original, one of the original trustees in America to be put on the TCG National Council. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I just want you to know, when I started the job as Artistic Director, I didn't know anything. I spent two years looking over my shoulder every time somebody asked me a question. And I finally realized, oh, they're asking me. I'm supposed to know that. <laughs> but half of what I learned, I learned from being on the board of TCG and learned talking to people like you at the conferences and at the forums. So thank you, thank you, thank you. When I started as artistic director at Seattle Children's Theater in 1984, I, I tried to get my fellow actors in Seattle, equity, non-equity, to audition, I tried to get funding or press for the theater and I kept getting the same response. Well, thanks, I'm not interested right now, but it's, it's just for children. And as a mom and as a theater artist and a teacher, a drama teacher at a private school, that really made me angry. And I, I felt that young people deserve more. And at that time, I was acting in a production of Pal Joey at the Seattle Rep when John Hirsch was the artistic director and Dan Sullivan was the associate artistic director. And one afternoon, I, I shared with Mr. Hirsch my frustration with this attitude about theater for young people. Oh, my beautiful award. It's OK. It's OK. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I only have three minutes. I better talk fast. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, my frustration with this attitude about theater for young people, and John said, well, he had noticed this in the States, and that it was very different for him growing up in Hungary in the 1930s. And he felt that the reason why people in Hungary had supported and attended all the arts, theater, ballet, and the symphony, was that from the very beginning, the work for the, even the youngest children was written, directed, designed, and performed by the most experienced and respected artists in the country. And that that set a standard for present and future audiences. And that made me realize that from one's youngest years, that art of the highest caliber should be part of one's everyday life. So working in a wonderful arts community in Seattle and Portland and Portland, <laughs> West Coast people, it inspires us at SET to always, always strive to produce work at the highest level. And the fact that we are offering children, and often their accompanying adults, their first experience of live theater makes us hone and polish our skills even more. And in Theater for Young Audience, we, we always, probably like you do, but we always talk about our audience all the time because we realize the responsibility inherent in introducing someone to theater for the first time. We want to develop the habit of going to theater, of attending performances of a wide range of stories and subjects and styles, of appreciating artistic effort and skills, 
and of participating in one's own possibilities of self-expression and building of communities. And we are so thankful, especially because of the public schools, that we played every cultural, ethnic, and socioeconomic portion of our society. And as all of you do, we work to convince our audience that theater is not an elitist activity. It is not or should not be boring or disconnected, but it is exciting and necessary. And now, more than ever, it is important that we come together in our communities to share the experience of being human. So thank you, and I wish you the best. I am so honored by this, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for the field, all of the young people whose lives you've changed, all of the parents whose lives you've changed as well. Um, and now I must invoke one of the most famous sayings in our profession, or at least one of them. The show must go on. Because while our original plenary speaker, Cheryl Strayed, is very ill and won't be here tonight, unfortunately, friends, this is Portland. Brilliant artists and speakers abound, and so I am very happy to introduce a speaker who may be last minute, but is no understudy. Lydia Yuknovich is the author of acclaimed books such as The Small Backs of Children, The Chronology of Water, and The Book of Joan. Her recent TED Talk, The Misfits Manifesto, is also being turned into a book. She also founded the workshop series, series Corporeal Writing here in Portland, Oregon. Please join me in welcoming Lydia Yuknovich to the stage. It's a deep, deep pleasure to be here with you. Thank me for letting me come into your room. Um, but I have to say before I do anything else that Cheryl, who I talked to before I came here, is profoundly sorry she can't be here with you tonight. I can confirm that she sounded terribly feverish, <laughs> also nasty bronchial, and ew, you don't want that here. Uh, but she's very sorry, and I'm, I'm happy to be here with you, thrilled, thrilled beyond measure. I have a tiny orientation to theater in that when I was seven, in my one and only acting appearance, I played a mushroom. <laughs> some, some kind of weird Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> Not even sure what was happening there. Um, I cried during the entire performance. <laughs> I have a vague memory of being kind of scooted off the stage because it scared me. I was terrified. And I did grow up going to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival for about seven years in a row. And I cried at every single play. <laughs> Are you noticing a motif? <laughs> I was so moved by live theater. It completely overwhelmed me every single time at every different age I was, particularly as a teen, when everything was... <laughs> and I saw Romeo and Juliet as a teen, and it just completely crushed me <laughs> forever. <laughs> and then in college, I, I had some time as a performance artist, and I noticed everyone was looking at me, <laughs> and that seemed suddenly terrible, so I... <laughs> Retreated to the page immediately, and I've been a storyteller ever since. <laughs> so thank you for being able to do and make and foster um, the stage. And I'm going to stick with the page, if you don't mind. <laughs> but speaking of maker culture, um, I want to talk to you about storytellers. We could all agree there are many kinds of storytellers. And 
I want to talk about storytellers we don't ordinarily look at as the people who are productive of the art that we're talking about in this conference. And if you'll, if you'll listen, uh, I want to tell you a story about these people who I love with my whole life and my whole body and my whole art. And I want to remind you to include them in your practice. Where I work at a community college in Oregon, the student body is made up of single mothers and ex-cons, people just out of rehab or recently relapsed, people living in their cars, people with two or three or even four or five jobs who are trying to feed their kids and not go nuts, people on mental health meds, and people who barely speak English, and people who are the first individuals to dare to dream that a life of the mind might not be as crazy as it sounds, that wanting to be an artist might not be nutbag. Migrant workers and gas station attendants, middle-aged people who lost their jobs and now have to reinvent themselves, former sex workers and dropouts and screw-ups, and yes, former or even current homeless people. There are outspoken Republicans sitting next to righteous tree huggers, business majors next to potheads, gay men next to football players, or football players who are gay men, next to boys whose granddads were in the KKK. I work in Gresham. <laughs> Pregnant women next to former gang members, straight-A students next to never passed a class in their lives, folks, transgendered men or women next to uber-conservative Christians, a veteran who lost both legs next to a woman who spent the previous week at a hospital on psych hold. Though there are still mostly white people, because it's still Oregon, there are also African American people, and Asian American, and Latino people, and people from of the other two Americas, Central and South. There are Ukrainians, and Filipinos, and Somalis. There are Vietnamese people, and Koreans, and American Indians, and more, and more. Remember America? In a way, I teach in the classroom of American broken down dreams. And yet, it's in these classrooms that America is secularly born again. The classroom of no choice who you sit next to. No way to separate yourself from otherness. No way to get out of the room unless you agree to be together for a little while. It's like a petri dish of who we are and where we're at right now, teaching and learning in a community college classroom, like on a bus or the Mac. Last year, I attended a legal hearing designed to determine whether a student in one of my classes should go back to jail or be placed in a special program that would allow him to continue going to classes part-time. I'd already bailed him out when he got arrested again, whether or not that was the right thing to do. I'd already written to the district judge on his behalf. I'd already provided evidence of his mind and talent. In the classroom, this man wrote essays about how hard it is to move from gang life in New Mexico to regular life in Oregon. His essays centered on a dream he had a dream of starting a program for gang youth. You know, like a rec center, some classes, some visiting artists and writers and business leaders. He said the gang life just relocated itself in micro versions once Latino men got here. And he wanted to spend the rest of his adult life trying to interrupt that motion. He wanted to teach people how to make art. His essays were passionate. I worked with this man for two years. I mean, he was in my classroom for two years. I watched him inspire people without even knowing he was doing it. He just told the truth. For two years, what he worked on the hardest was where to put rage. And I'd convinced him 
The page, like the stage, would hold it. He became more and more articulate, and then he became eloquent, and then he became a person who could truly effect change, his beautiful pages rising like birds in the sky. So when he asked me to speak on his behalf at his hearing and to write the district judge, I did. Enthusiastically, repeatedly, but his past kept coming up, getting bigger and bigger and not white and harder to explain. And nothing I said or did seems to matter. Not my PhD, not my 30 years of teaching experience, not my passionate plea about the excellence and eloquence of his writing. In the end, we were just two people who had both, at one time in our lives, broken the law and been arrested and gone to jail. I have a past too. I got another chance. He had to go back to that other institution. The reasoning used is mind-numbingly idiotic, even if we call it the law. Now he's writing essays from jail, and I don't know if he'll lose heart, but I would understand if he did. People make mistakes every day, big ones. I do. You do. Another student I'm working with is currently living in her car. She did two tours of duty in the Middle East and came home to her daughter, minus the use of her right hand and half of her face. The one-bedroom apartment she was living in in Portland raised the rent from 400 a month, which she could barely manage as a single mother with a disability and PTSD, to 950 with less than 60 days notice, which is legal in Oregon. Boom, like a bomb going off, homeless. The wait at the social service office, in case you don't know this, where she can get help is 90 days. The wait at the women's shelter right now is 28 days, and she's not as high on the intake list as the women who are being beaten and in immediate danger. One day, she's in my American Lit class, hoping to become a teacher. The next day, she's living in her car. Her daughter passed off every day to a different friend. I couldn't live with knowing that, so I found her some immediate help. But here's the thing. I know I can't keep doing that for everyone. The choices we're making every day of our lives will mean that more people who can't make it emerge. They are the new walking wounded of our country? Where are the Purple Hearts for women, men, and children who have managed to endure? Listen, I'm not telling you this to highlight my efforts. I'm telling you this to highlight how much we are all pieces of them. I'm like them. You might look at some of my life events like a list of indicators of trouble ahead, I'm going to tell you what they are. You'll see what I mean. <laughs> Between the ages of four and 10, I ate non-nutritive things. It's called pica, like dirt and paper and small stones and pennies. Yes, they came out. <laughs> As a kid, I missed quite a few developmental stages. I didn't speak out loud for a good long time, much later than child psychologists and doctors suggest. I wet my pants through sixth grade, and I couldn't ride a bike until I was 25. I'm the daughter of an abusive father whose house I narrowly escaped with my life. I have two epically failed marriages under my belt, and I flunked out of college as an undergraduate, twice. I've had one episode of drug rehab and two brief staycations in jail. I've also been homeless. But I'm not a deviant, and I'm not a loser, and I'm not a criminal, and I'm not a bad person. Perhaps that list is mapping out the fault lines of a life, but can't we admit that everyone on the planet, everyone in this room carries fault lines in their lives? 
So isn't there a way to see the echo effect of all of our vulnerabilities inside all the stories of our lives? Our vulnerabilities make us most human, most beautiful, most like each other. What was mostly wrong with me when I did those bad things, and I still make mistakes, is that I took a nosedive at that point in my life, the day my daughter died, the day she was born. And when that piled up on top of where I came from, abuse and addiction, honestly, I just didn't know how to live with that story. But my life, like a lot of other people's lives, also has interesting, positive mutations in it, in addition to all my fuck-ups. I have a PhD. I teach. I publish books. Sometimes I get an award or something, or I get to stand on a magical stage. You want to know what makes me different from the people I'm telling you about? Exactly nothing which is to say that I've been like the people I'm talking to you about, and some of you are too, and we're all standing in rooms next to one another, and the one language we can all understand, if we remember, if we choose it, is empathy and compassion. No one is a perfect person. No one got here without occasionally falling to pieces. Maybe it's time we admit that we need all of us for any of us to make it even the people who blew it. We may be misfits, but that's only if you look at us at the wrong angle. Turn us even slightly, your angle of vision, and we brighten like the phenomenal colors inside a kaleidoscope. Now more than ever, we have to let go of the idea that categorizations such as business and industry and education and theater and government and art and law and medicine and technology are separate and isolated from one another. We have to figure out how to braid our languages and differences before it's too late, before they separate us some more into camps where we hate each other and can't remember how to talk to each other. I understand the stories I just told you are sad stories. So let me tell you about someone who started out sad and shot the moon. This woman started out in a series of foster homes. Her story is so bleak, I'm not even going to tell it. You already know how bleak. You've seen it in crappy movies. <laughs> even though we don't like to look at it, we know. Passed from home to home, from bad to worse, her body the word for it. Her entire childhood, brutalized. I'm not ashamed to tell you I'm surprised she came to my classroom alive. But here's the thing. When she showed up, what she had in her was an undying, burning fire passion for three things. Math, science, and poetry. Like a strange new species. She graduated from community college with a transfer degree, which for those of you who don't know, is like a ticket to ride. To a misfit, that's a golden ticket. She went to get a degree at Portland State University. From there, she went to MIT, which I bet you've heard of. And from there, she did postdoctoral work at Yale. You want to know where she works now? CERN, where the Hadron Collider is. I hear her first book of poetry is forthcoming. <laughs> Everything against her. Nothing stopping her except all the people who tried. Or the people who looked at her and misread her. Or the people who couldn't see her at all. Her brilliance, her artistry, her beauty. I hope with all of my heart that my Latino friend, for I can no longer limit the word for our relationship to student, keeps writing his essays from prison. He's a part of me. I hope with my whole body that he does not lose heart. I believe in him for as long as it takes. I hope that my single mother friend doesn't fall through the cracks 
I hope she doesn't let go of her dream to study and teach world literature in another country, not this one, preferably the Middle East, is what she told me. I hope our country doesn't let her down. What I hope most of all tonight is that we all begin to recognize how much we have to change in the face of our current culture. I hope we learn to admit that we carry the trace of one another, no matter who you are, that all our languages may yet reach one another inside our differences. And a thing you can do tonight, tomorrow, the next day, is stop treating the people like women, like people of color, like LGBT people, like poor people, or people who have blown it as the raw material for building the rest of culture. Tonight and tomorrow and the next day, we can treat the people who've been used to make everybody else look shiny as brothers and sisters. Thank you. Can you see me trying to physically escape? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to talk to you. I understand ordinarily there would be a kind of Q&A thing right now, and I'm not scared of you to talk to you. <laughs> but I also understand if, if that, you've never met me, so I could also understand if, if you don't want to. So I'll, I'll just stand here awkwardly for a little bit. And... <laughs> Does that mean I can leave? <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thanks, Lydia, again for being here with us. That was really just moving, enlightening. Um, I think that you gave us a lot to, to think about. And um, I also love just from having seen your, your talks that just the way that you inspire us to think about your real story, telling the many different stories that exist and really committing to, to your own. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing the stories of, of the people you're teaching. And um, we're glad to meet you. So, and I know that we have some of uh, some books, some of Lydia's books here. So after we're done, um, hopefully you'll be able to sign a few. Great. Um, so another of our favorite uh, theater terms is opening night party. <laughs> and. Um, that's what we're going to do next. And what I want to do is invite uh, our opening plenary and our opening night party, one of our opening night party sponsors, um, Carlo Scan Scanduzzi of Scanduzzi Krebs, to join me up here for a minute. Thank you. It's very difficult uh, after. Lydia, um, what you have said, the humanity that you have given us tonight is extraordinary. And uh, really, all I can say is, is that, you know, we can all go on and maybe drink and maybe not, but have fun and remember what Lydia said and remember that, you know, the people that are around us are part of humanity. They are part of who we are. So as Can Juicy Krebs, we are very, very proud and very happy, you know, to actually sponsor this evening and sponsor the party. So without further ado, have fun. Thank you. 
<laughs> so that's it. We're going to go party together now. Um, there's transportation to the Portland Center stage, and we'll see you there.